Great. Hello and welcome to another episode of Interview with ISO, where we have the honor of interviewing some of the leaders in academic life of University of Toronto. My name is Kimia, and today with me we have Professor Steve Jordan from Department of Psychology, who has been a faculty member since 1995. Hello, Professor Jordan. I'm so glad to have you here today. Hey, Kimia. Great to be with you. Could you tell us a little bit about the courses or programs you're involved in at the moment? Sure. Yeah, for, for the most part, my baby is, of course, intro psych, uh, the first <laughs> half. So technically, it's intro to the biological and cognitive psychology or something like that. Uh, and so that's my my big monster course, 1600 plus students a year where we use all this ed tech and do a bunch of fancy stuff. So so that's the one where it keeps me kind of busy and I keep trying to think how, how we can even make that better. Um, over the last little while, I've also been teaching a little bit of the history of psychology, uh, C85. Uh, and so now both Jerry and I, Jerry Kupchik, excuse me, my, my colleague, so sometimes <laughs> both he and I now will trade off uh, that course. So I suspect I'll still be offering that uh, now and then. I, I have a couple of other courses on my mind that you may, one of them is a psychology of activism course that I'm starting to think about. I hope to be offering that in the future, but, but not yet. Yeah, have to say it. Uh, what are some challenges students might face while studying this program? Um, so uh, are we going to talk COVID or are we not going to talk COVID? <laughs> are we I imagining? Know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because there, there's, there's this challenge in general. So, you know, for example, in, in any course, like my very large course, the challenge is feeling human, <laughs> keeping that feeling of humanity when there's so many people in the course. And, and for the students, what that means is it, their success is often as much a function of their ability to kind of gain control of their own behaviors, you know, to study when they have to study, to start assignments at the right period of time. So, so sometimes it's less about a student's sort of intellectual ability and more about their work ethic and organization and, and their willingness to kind of make themselves do what they need to be doing to do well. Uh, and so in a big class that can be challenging because the, the professor can't really look over your shoulder or all that close, it's really up to you. Uh, and the other challenge, of course, of any of these big classes is, is they're like what we call survey courses. I sometimes say it's kind of like you've been invited to a restaurant and the person says, I want you to try the whole menu. I'm going to give you a little taste of everything on the whole menu so that when you come back, you'll know what you like. Uh, and so our intro courses are kind of like that. We'll tell you a little bit about the brain and then we'll tell you about perception. Then we'll tell you about memory and all of these things you get just enough to kind of feel hungry for more. And then we move on to the next thing. Uh, so it's and, and some of those things you love and some of those things you don't like, but you have to eat them all, <laughs> so to speak, as we go <laughs> through. So it does help you down the road to know what you want to follow up on. But at the time, it feels like, you know, nothing is hard, but there's just a lot, so much to learn. Uh, and that's the other challenge in those introductory sort of breadth courses is just the amount of material you have to try to commit to memory at that point. Of course. Of course. Um, what are some qualities you have seen in students who have excelled in your courses? Well, I, I mean, certainly we've done some research along the way, and I was kind of alluding to one of those early on. Some of our earliest work shows that there's, there's this, you can measure students' personality. There's something called the Big Five Personality Index, and it captures things like how introverted, extroverted are you, how adventurous uh, to new experiences, how open to new experiences are you. The one that predicts performance in, in my class, and probably every large class, is something we call conscientiousness, which is just that idea of, doing things the right way, reading instructions carefully, you know, taking the time to figure out when due dates are. So the, the, the conscientious students tend to do well in these big classes. And, and the sort of message, I guess, to, to all students from that is just sort of paying attention to the details. Um, you know, at my class, I think I figured out I have 13 due dates in my class because we use all this <laughs> technology and often there's multiple steps. And so the steps are due at different times. Yeah. So I'll say things like just, print this out and put it on your fridge door if you have to or, or whatever when are all these due dates and just simple things like that that's what conscientious people do they keep track of all this stuff and it's amazing how much of a difference that can make to your grade um you know on top of your natural academic ability and things like that so so that's a critical uh component for sure the other thing that i love in students but it doesn't necessarily predict success in my course uh, i think it predicts success in life is uh the student who is really 
thinking deeply, thinking critically, thinking creatively, doubting what they see, coming up with different ideas of their own. Um, that can be a bad thing, actually, in an introductory <laughs> course, because it's kind of like, well, just learn the facts like, for now. Yeah. But it's a good thing down the road. I mean, when we when we imagine our students, especially in third and fourth year, when they're getting involved in research, maybe, or, you know, even just starting to go towards the workforce, those skills, critical thinking, creative thinking, communication skills, collaboration skills, they are what really will determine how successful you are. So I, I try my best best to make that part of the course that students are constantly challenged to use these skills um, but also I, I, I come into contact with the students who come to office hours and they say this said whatever but in my culture I don't think that's true at all and I'm like cool great to think about it. let's talk about some of these differences because you might be right you, you might be 100% right and there may be studies showing that uh, so I, I love those attributes in students um, they don't quite fit with an intro course, but nonetheless, uh, they are the ones that I think every student should be looking for every excuse to exercise. Yeah, sure, there are the qualities that make them exceptional. Uh, talking about the research, how do you think students should look for research opportunities? Yeah, this is one of my favorite topics because <laughs> because 99%, if not more, do it wrong. Um, and then so I give a, I'll, I'll give a funny analogy that I sometimes give to students because they remember this afterwards. I say, imagine you wanted to be married one day. And you thought, hmm, but when I meet that person, I'd like to I'd like to have a little bit of experience in relationships. I don't want to be a complete like I have never been in a relationship before. I don't know what I'm doing kind of person. So imagine you went up to other people and said, hey, I want to be married one day. So can, can, can we get a little can I just hang out with you and have some experience in a relationship with you? Because I want experience for down the, the, long, the line. Uh, that person's not going to be very impressed, right? We, we don't want somebody to want to hang out with us because they want experience for the future. We want them to hang out exactly. with us because they find us fascinating. Exactly. <laughs> you know, exactly. That's who we want to be around. And it's the same thing with supervisors. So, so many people come to my door, knock on the door, and they'll say, sir, do you have any room in your lab? Because I hope to go to grad school or something like that, and I need some research experience. Um, which to me says, so, you know, I'm always tempted to say, what do I do? What is my research? Can, can you name one paper I I've ever written uh, and, and ultimately you can quickly show that person knows nothing about me or what I do. Um, so that's not the way. <laughs> that's the big X. Don't do it that way. Um, the right way to do it is as follows. And it's going to take a little bit of work and that's that's what's key. First of all, you know, I told you about that recipe where you or sorry, that menu where you get to taste all these different parts of psychology. So hopefully after a couple of years, and that's usually when it happens, we can we can talk about why it's more often third or fourth year. Um, but by about third year, you should know what things you've learned that really resonate with you. What, what do you really, really enjoy thinking about? And you should be then able to find out who here at U of T, and you have all of U of T, but especially UT Scarborough, perhaps, who does research related to that thing? What's his, how, how can, who does research that's as close as I can come to what I find fascinating? Uh, then you should read a paper or two of theirs uh, and really get to know what their research is. Then that's when you reach out. Either, what I recommend is if you can find out when they have office hours, because technically that's the time they already have set aside. And if you can now, you know, politely knock on their door and say, I know it's your office hours, I'm not actually in your class right now, um, but, but I would love to chat with you. And I just thought this might be a good time. And if there's, if you have no students here, uh, and so they're more likely to talk to you then because they're kind of waiting for students. First of all, you're not catching them when they're in the mis middle of something else. Um, and then to be able to literally say something like the following. Um, you know, hello, Professor Schmuckler. I know one of the things you do is research on, on music cognition. And I read your paper about this key finding algorithm you did. And I thought that was really cool how, how that thing all worked up. And I had some ideas that, that I wanted to share. I wanted to see what your thoughts on, on these ideas were. Uh, you know, now you're, now you're geeking out with the person and, and you can bring that to, is there any chance to do research? But, but you're leading with what's important, which is you do something I think is really freaking cool. I would love to do that. I would love to do that with you. That's what we want. We want students doing research with us that love the research, that, that find it fascinating. They're not worried about graduate school. Yes, of course, this will help them for graduate school, but they're worried about right now. They, they, they have an opportunity to do research with somebody and they wanna jump in. And, and that's, what sh that's what you should bring to the door is I wanna exactly. work with you now because that's really cool. Yeah. 
So they have to like make a connection with their own interest and then make a connection with their supervisor's interest. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. that little step I mentioned about reading the paper, what that does is it lets you know the way the supervisor talks about that issue. So you get yes. to, you get to read them speaking about whatever it may be. Uh, and you learn some of that terminology. And so now, now when you're speaking with them about that, you're using some of the right words the right way. Uh, and, and that really impresses somebody, you know, if I'm a memory, so I was a memory researcher for a while, if you start talking about the mirror effect and you actually seem to know what you're talking about, that's telling me, wow, this person has already invested in this relationship. You know, before I said yes, they spent time and effort and, and were willing to do that uh, before. And that makes me more likely to say yes, you know, when I yes, see exactly. somebody who's, who's put in that effort. So yeah, sometimes you'll get no. And let me mention that too, by the way. One of the skills you have to learn, which is very tough, is taking no with a smile and a thank you and a, and a sort of next step thing. So, so if you do that whole pitch and the person says, I've got too much going on, I'm just whatever. Um, you say, okay, I, I understand 100%, but I really, really want to do research with you. So I'll probably come back next year if, if that's okay. Is there anything I could do between now and next year that would make me more attractive to you as a, as a student to work with? Um, and, you know, now you're, you're, this is sort of tricky psychology to an extent, but let's <laughs> say they say, I would love you to go take that um, uh, upper level statistics course, because if we do any research, we're going to need to use regression or something. So if you came in and you knew how to do that, that would be attractive to me. Okay. So now you go away and you come back next year. Remember me, I'm back. So that first one, you can sometimes see it as an investment for the future. You're introducing yeah. yourself, you're showing your passion, uh, and maybe you're getting a call all that you know maybe that prof saying no no and if you're trying the second year for example you might get a lot of no's it's not a reason not to do it do it um set those seeds get to know those professors ask them what you should be doing and then just think about okay i may not get, get it this year but next year I've, i'm in a better chance now i've you know when i come to the door they're going to recognize me i'm going to be able to say i was here a year ago i was eager a year ago i'm still eager yeah. uh you know and, and that's a very powerful thing to be giving to the prof so much more sure. powerful than hey yeah. i need research experience do you have any to give me important steps um how do you see the future of education especially in the field of psychology um so yeah i kind of live in that, <laughs> in that world a little bit so I, so i think about that a lot you know we're trying to society has a bit of a challenge in the sense that we we want to have everybody have access to education with as few barriers as possible. We, re we really see education as empowering to, to so many people. And so we want to try to find ways of, of making it available at scale often. So 1600 student class, you know, how do you teach a 1600 student class? Well, um, and so that's a sort of challenge for me. So I certainly believe that technology is going to play a larger role. And I, and I believe that because the way you really learn about something is not by memorizing, despite everything I just said. Memorizing is fine. Memorizing will get you the terminology and stuff. But to really understand something, you have to work with that knowledge. Uh, and so it's what we exactly. call active learning, uh, not just passive, you know, having absorbed, but working with the knowledge, doing something, creating something. And so the question is, how can you have students, if you're going to do things at scale, or you know, online courses or 1600 student courses or whatnot, how can you have students engage in experiences that really, you know, we almost want to go back to Socrates at times, you know, that sort of Socratic method of people challenging each other and exploring ideas together. You know, we always imagine that as our seminar, our fourth year small class experience, but can we do that online? And can we come up with clever technologies and educational processes that really gives students, it's gonna come all the way back to those skills I talked about, you know, time using the knowledge, which will deepen their understanding, but also exercise their critical thinking and creative thinking and such. I, I actually think that we're already seeing education shift. I don't wanna call it shift, shift is wrong, but the focus used to be just on knowledge transfer, dumping a bunch of information into our students' heads. Uh, and yeah, we hope they would think about things and we hope they would communicate about things. And maybe we had some oral presentations in our, in our um, uh, curriculum, but more and more, I think we're going to see those skills as 
maybe more important than the information that that when a, we know that when a lot of students graduate they may have a certain career in mind uh, but quite often they end up pivoting a few times and, and they'll go through five or six careers before they find one that, that really sticks for them and how do they do that go from you know one thing to something else well these skills that i talked about like the critical thinking the creative thinking they're, they're sometimes called transferable or transversal they will be they will help you be successful in any context and so i think more and more that's what we're thinking about doing with our students we're going to give them specific information but we really want to have them ready to succeed in a job market that we don't even know what it is and so it's this ambiguous future that we're throwing you guys all in how do we prepare you for that well we we make sure you can think we make sure you can talk well we make sure you can collaborate with other people and you know i think the future of education is going to put a lot more emphasis on those skills at least i hope so that's where i'm trying to push it anyway <laughs> of course hopefully <laughs> um could you give us a brief introduction to the advanced learning technologies lab sure yeah so so this is kind of a funny um uh, roundabout way things happen so i was i was formally trained as a cognitive psychologist so i studied memory a lot of things like that and i would study them in a lab in a very um I don't know, controlled way. Uh, and I would publish papers that six or 10 other experts in memory would, would read. Uh, and that was fine. That was my career for a while. But was a, as I got into teaching, I really started to enjoy the challenge of teaching a lot of students well. Um, so this idea of how can you scale up deep learning? Uh, and so over time, my sort of interest in cognitive psychology transformed to, to a much more applied learning issues. So the Advanced Learning Technologies Lab is really focused on how can we harness technologies to bring really powerful learning experiences to large groups of students. Um, and so the lab itself, it, there, there's different kinds of critters that kind of hang out in the lab. So it's the one kind of critter are, are the psychology students. So the psychology students, a prototypical approach in the lab is that they would um, go to the educational psychology literature and try to find something that seemed very powerful. Um, so I'll just make something up now. I, I know one of them is like concept maps, um, that if you ask students to form concept maps, uh, that can help them really understand material well. And so now you can say, okay, it works cool on its own, but could we use technology to somehow make it work even better and make it work in classes where it might not be easy to use otherwise? And so we start imagining how we can take this powerful little process, which is often K to 12. K to 12 is where they do some of the best research on education. So we'll find something some K to 12 teachers doing that's really powerful and say, how can we scale it? And so we'll imagine that. And that's where we usually have now some computer science developers kind of come into play and they start to build up some sort of uh, basic beta version of what we're talking about. And then the psychology student does research. Does it actually do what we hope it does? So if we have students use this, if we try to measure learning in some way, or at least perceptions of learning, does it look like there actually is, is good learning being supported here? Uh, and for those successful ones, they, they might blow up and, and ultimately become something that we're sharing with others, either commercially or, or not commercially. So it's a sort of mix of, of psych research with computer science, actually building that into an application um, and then occasionally there, there's fun. So I'll, I'll give you one other kind of example to give you a sense. So course, many of you know that at the beginning of COVID, I created this um, free course on anxiety just to kind of explain to people, what is it? Why, why are you feeling that way? What's the biology underlying what you feel right now? And how can you control that a little bit? So that, that course uh, has now been seen by about 150,000 people worldwide, which is wow. kind of crazy. It's been really nice. Uh, but one of the things I try to teach them in that course is how to relax, how to formally summon relaxation over their body. And this has been a long standing, uh, it's not really educational, I've kind of taken a bit of a step on you there, but it's, a, but it's something we know works. And, and this is always where things start with the alt lab. Do, can we know something that works? And so we know relaxation training helps people with anxiety when it's one person. So if you came to me with anxiety, I would say, okay, we could put you through this. Can we put 150,000 students through that? Um, you know, now that we have that sort of um, demand from the course. And so with, with a, a group of students now, one doing his honors thesis, but he assembled a whole team around him somehow. Um, we, and we got 
connected with this company. And so we're building out an app that just supports relaxation training. Uh, I think it'll be released okay. in about a month. And so that was the case again of thinking through, okay, how can we do this at scale? Oh, we could do it in an app in the following way, finding someone that would build that out for us. And then we hope to have that live in about two or three weeks. And then we're going to start collecting data, really looking at how practice connects with um, reductions in anxiety. So if people use this a lot and we can keep track of that, do we actually see their anxiety levels dropping and what is the dose curve, so to speak? How much practice do they need before they get benefits? Uh, but that's another example of sort of starting with something that works and then trying to, technology is just, um, it just lets you do things at scale. It's good at logistics. And so we try to figure that out uh, and bring those big practices to the masses. It's kind of what we do. <laughs> so looking forward to hear from your app. Um, you are one of the award-winning co-inventors of the successful educational tool called Peer Scholar. Would you want to give us an overview of how you came up with the idea? Okay, well, you, you want to be <laughs> honest truth, I guess, because <laughs> I, I can tell a very different story now. But here's the honest truth. At that time, I was still a cognitive psychologist. I hadn't done a lot of educational psychology, so I was doing research on memory. I was teaching a very large class. And one of the things I didn't like about the class, and in fact, it was co-taught by a number of people. There were different sections. So it was intro psych back then, like 15, 20 years ago. I can't yeah, remember oh, how wow. this, is, this is my, hang on, I got to show off now. So this is my 25-year pin. I have a 25-year oh, pin. Oh, <laughs> That's how old I am. I've been, I've been at UTSC 25 years. Uh, so back in that time, not too long after I was hired, I was one of three people teaching intro psych and it was all multiple choice. That's all it was. Read the textbook, do multiple choice exams. And I've told you a little bit about skills. I even had that skills bug then, but I, I didn't know how to talk about it the same way. I, I jokingly say, I really knew two words that, that really prompted Peer Scholar. And those two words were writing good. <laughs> I, I thought <laughs> there's something about writing that, that makes people think, organize their thoughts, work on their communication skill. And I thought it was a shame that we did not have any writing in our intro psych class. Uh, I'd heard a little bit about this peer assessment idea. Um, and the idea was, hey, you could have students write and then you could have them look at what each other submitted. And you could ultimately get the students to assess each other's work. And the research seemed to suggest this was original research by Dwayne Paré, the, co the other co-founder. He, he was a master's student at that time. And so his research checked and, and showed the following, that if, that if, say, your work was assessed by five or more peers, if they graded it, uh, and then we looked at their average grade of those five or six, while any individual peer couldn't be trusted, per se, <laughs> if you <laughs> average five or six, that average grade turns out to be very much in line with what faculty members would give. And so honestly, very early on, we didn't really understand the learning benefits. We used peer assessment as a means to an end. We said, oh, if we write this way, um, we can have students kind of assessing each other's work. Now we don't have to pay for all of that grading, which takes forever and is logistically painful. We can get feedback right away and it'll be great. Uh, and we can have three or four writing assignments in, in intro psych all of a sudden. Uh, and so it was great until the TA union got upset <laughs> about, <laughs> about students give, grading each other, sort of. And we had, a, a, anyway, we lost <laughs> this, this legal battle. Um, and we had to rethink Peer Scholar. And, and that was the best thing that ever happened to us, really. Because somewhere in that interim, we started realizing that when students are assessing the work of their peers, it's not just about getting a grade out of them. In fact, that's probably the least valuable thing that's going on there. What's really valuable is all of the thought that goes into when exactly. you see peers were, you know, trying to figure out how good is it? What sort of comment feedback can I give this person? So I slowly, um, I, I always have to, I always have to credit um, somebody who is the director of our center for teaching something in innovation, CTSI, Support and Innovation, Center for Teaching and Support and Innovation downtown. So there's a woman named Carol Rollheiser. She was trained very deeply in educational theory. And I became friends with her as I was doing some of the stuff. And I call her my second PhD supervisor because she would constantly say, you know what you're doing there, Steve? You should read these papers because you're doing something people have done before and there's a whole history behind it and it's more powerful than you know. 
And so she kept teaching me educational psychology, really. Uh, and over time, this developed into the modern peer scholar. So the modern peer scholar uh, is not about getting students to give grades <laughs> anymore. Um, it's about all of that learning that happens. And so really, the critical, if you really want to understand what peer scholar is about, it's the last thing that happens. And the last thing that happens is students seeing feedback that their peers have given them and then trying to make their work better based on that feedback. Absolutely great. So, yeah, that's something that, that in, in education theory, they now call a growth mindset, having that, that openness to, to listen to feedback because you want to become better and better. And, and um, it's not easy. It's not easy. Most of us, when we hear feedback, we we just attack the feedback giver right away. Uh, we the good say, thing is it's anonymous. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it is. But that fight and flight is still there. And so if you kind of work backwards, then the idea is we want students to learn this skill. They're only going to learn it by using it a lot. So that's why we keep saying respond to peer one then peer two, then peer three, because you have to repeatedly engage the skills as you go through. But the best way to learn how to accept feedback is to first be on the other side, to give the feedback. If you've had that experience of being the one giving feedback to peers, then you know that your intentions were good. You were just trying to help all of these people as you went. And so now when you're reading feedback from others, you kind of know that, okay, they, they're trying to help me. Um, you know, yes. maybe it rubs me the wrong way, maybe whatever, but, and so everything, is is about that moment. And so the 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 that was a really bad way to explain it. But so so let me so let me give you the front to back way to explain it. So what actually happens, of course, is students just submit some composition, and and it can be any course, any level. So it could you know it could be a math composition, it could be a, a English kind of thing, whatever psychology. Um, then they see what some of their peers have submitted. And we really walk them through an analysis of their peer work. So they have to answer specific questions that we pose about each peer work. And again, that's meant to engage critical thinking and creative thinking and communication skills as we go. Um, and, and so they do all that in the assess phase, assessing a number of different peers, getting what I call repeated structured practice with these skills. Um, and then while they're doing that, a number of peers are doing the same to their work. So in that third phase that I was that I was starting with, that's when they see the feedback now. And again, one by one, we guide them through an analysis of the feedback. Most students, when they see feedback, they want to fight or flee. We know 50% of students don't read what profs write on, on essays. They don't even want to see it. <laughs> They're just like, nope, I just want to see my grade. I don't want to, I don't want to see it. And the ones that do read it are probably looking to see what they can fight sometimes like you know what, what, what can can i get any extra marks by by doing x or y we want to encourage students to sit think and learn don't flee don't fight read and really understand what that person's saying and see Be if there's anything you can take from it yeah and open to growth you know, is there something this person said that will make my work better um and and so yeah we're encouraging them to do that and the real kind of highlight i guess happens at least from a lot of students mind when we give them that opportunity to improve, you know, all through they can be kind of, they, they tell us they're kind of mentally grumbly. There's one way one person said it, they're reading the feedback, they don't know, they're kind of, yeah, okay, I guess that's a good point, I guess that's not. But then they end up fixing their work. And when they're done, they look at it and they think, it's better. I'm, I'm gonna get a better good grade from the professor. <laughs> yeah, uh, this, this was good. And, and so that point is really important because all the pain before that is sort of worthwhile. <laughs> And, and that's, the, that's the most heartening thing for me. We've done a lot of research with Peer Scholar. The most heartening thing is it is active learning, as we described, working with the knowledge. Um, often students think active learning is work, unfamiliar work, and they don't like it. They would rather just have lectures and, and multiple choice tests, but they like Peer Scholar. Uh, and that's, that's what's really heartening. They say, we wish there was more of this in other classes. It is a lot of work. So I know students put in a lot of time and a lot of effort. Don't always get the mark they think they should after all that work and all that effort. And yet when you ask them, do you wish this was in more classes? They say, yes, I do. I, I can see the value of what this is doing for me. So, so that's what's so heartening for me uh, with Peer Scholar. It's really cool. Yeah, it's a really cool too. <laughs> uh, how do you think this pandemic affect education in general? Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I've written about this and talked about this at a few levels. And, and there's a level you guys don't, 
wouldn't, it wouldn't be directly. So of course it affects students different from faculty. Let's talk faculty for a moment, just to give you guys a little bit of, of a, a, a peek behind the curtain. <laughs> um, you know, pre COVID, the way universities kind of worked is the vast majority of professors taught in a traditional face-to-face, -face, you know, human way. And then there was this small group of professors that were playing with online learning. And that group of professors knew about the history of online learning, which, which, which was always that sort of distance learning was bad, watered down, not as good as being in an actual classroom. And a lot of them, a lot of us, I should say, because I was part of that group, took that as a challenge. And we've been working for a long time trying to figure out how to make online learning as engaging as possible and et cetera. Um, so, but imagine that's like 10% of faculty or less. And now along comes COVID and we have what I call a forced migration. <laughs> All of these 90% who are happy in the traditional world got pushed into that online world. You have to go do this. And, and it's almost like being pushed into a different culture because we were quite different. And that culture that was there had to take in all of these 90% of people and try to enculture them, try to teach them how, did, how do you teach online? Uh, how do you test online, which is a major issue for us? How do you do active learning online? And so behind the scenes, there was a whole lot of scrambling of that sort of 10% um, trying to help the 90% survive in this culture and also trying to get them as deeply in the culture as we could. We didn't want them just to do the minimal they needed. We wanted them to get the bug because those of us who are, who are in the online world have a bug for trying to make things constantly better. It's that growth mindset. How can you make your course constantly better, constantly better, constantly better? Uh, so we wanted them to catch that too. So that's been going on behind the scenes and, and in front of the scenes, what that means to students is that they're getting a lot of variability and they're actually getting I mean, I, I have to say a, a worse product and, you know, there's no, there's no way around that uh, to some extent. It may not continue to be that, but when, when you throw a bunch of faculty into something they're learning on the fly and then you guys are, are the ones consuming what they're learning, it, on average, it takes about three years to create a really good online course. Um, that's what the data shows. And you're catching these people in year one. And there are people who didn't necessarily want to be doing online teaching in the first place. They just have no choice. And so you guys have experienced a lot of kludgy, you know, all, all sorts of, I think, pure variability depending on the professor and how they de dealt with things like academic integrity. We can talk about one tricky issue for there um, and how they dealt with lecturing. So like me, for example, I, I did not, all of my lectures this term were um, 10 to 20 minute mini lectures that I embedded directly in the electronic textbook so the students could read and then they'd get me saying something for a little bit, but not enough to bore them, hopefully, <laughs> you know, make some pointer to really strongly, interestingly, and then wait for an opportunity a little further in the reading and then I'm, I'm back there again. So those little mini lectures, you know, the students found really, it worked well for them. It kind of kept them engaged, but other props were probably pressing play and talking for two hours, uh, you know, to people who are sitting in their computers that are trying to distract them and, and pull them five directions during those whole two hours. And so that's been the challenge from you guys' side is the, the two greatest culprits uh, of online learning are, you know, just getting your butt in front of the couch. So procrastination or getting in front of learning, I should say procrastination, um, and then keeping it there, you know, distraction, trying to avoid distraction. It's, it's almost, we're almost all the way back to that conscientiousness stuff we were talking about. You know, there's you and how smart you are and all the abilities you bring, but none of that will show if you can't stick your butt where it's gotta be and stick with what you gotta be paying attention to. And so those skills are almost more important than those other, other skills we talk about. And so I've, I've done things, I, I gave a, a webinar on how to succeed in online learning and we talk about um, this a little bit. And, try to bring some tips in. I'll, I'll just mention one here to kind of, we, we could maybe give you a link to the webinar if you wanted to share that. Um, but there's something called from psychology called the Zygarnik effect. Um, Zygarnik being uh, actually, um, I think she was a student of Pavlov, Ivan Pavlov actually, but uh, she did this, this really neat experiment where she had people do 12 tasks over some period of time, but for six of the tasks, she interrupted them somewhere. They didn't get to finish the task. The other six they got to finish. Then she called them back afterwards and they said, what did you remember? What were the things you remember doing in the lab when you were here? 
they could remember the unfinished business really well. In fact, they reported continually thinking about it, their mind kind of coming back to that task they didn't get to finish. Whereas the finished ones seemed like they were just forgotten. This is why, by the way, Stranger Things and every series you know ends with a cliffhanger, unfinished business. Okay. If you leave unfinished business, then the mind comes back to it. So, so I try to teach students weird things like this. When you're learning online, don't read to the end of chapter one and stop because you've just kind of finished. You've put an end to things. Either read 75% of chapter one um, and so leave it unfinished and it'll weigh on your mind. You'll be like, oh, I gotta go finish that. And then if you go finish it, don't stop there. Get into chapter two. Make sure you're you know, partway through. So keep leaving things at a half finished state. That will tend to pull you back. It'll tend to be on your mind when, when you're not there. Like project two, by the way, one of the, if you have guys, guys have assignments due, I know it may not be due till three weeks from now. And I know you might not finish it until three weeks minus two hours from now or something like that or an hour from now. You're going to do it at the last minute. You're going to finish it at the last minute. But if you can start it earlier, if you can just get things going, you know, two weeks ahead of time and start your mind thinking about that issue, you will find your mind will return to that issue. And, and during those two weeks when you otherwise wouldn't have thought about it at all until, oh my goodness, it's, it's due. Instead, you started thinking about it here and it keeps coming to mind and maybe it pulls you back and you might even work on it a little bit and leave it unfinished again and it pulls you back and, and you might ultimately end up realizing wow I kind of did this over two weeks I was kind of thinking about it and building it so that idea of just get something started and then leave it unfinished until it's finished <laughs> so you know when your course is over then obviously you want to have read all the chapters and stuff like that but but that's a little trick from psychology that can help with those two uh, nasty. The other thing with distraction, by the way, um, which I which I say to everybody is, I wish you could see my space right here. But your your learning space, or in my case, my workspace, should only be for learning, learning, or, or only for work, whatever it is. You should not bring your cell phone into the space if you can avoid it. You should not have your your phone or your notifications coming through to your computer so that every text message is shown up. You should not be logged into any of your social media. You know, you should really make a habit that says, when I step into this room, it's like I'm sitting in a classroom. Well, maybe even more because you might distract yourself in a classroom, <laughs> but, but I'm gonna try to be even better. This room is about learning. And I will come in here and I will sit down. I will open that bit of learning. I will start into it. Um, and then I'll just stick with it. And that's the best way to, to avoid distraction because those little things will just pull your, pull our mind away so quickly and have us spending a ton of time on irrelevant stuff. For myself, distraction was a real struggle. Now I know why. <laughs> um, do you have any recommendations for students who are aiming for a graduate program like master's or PhD? Yeah. So this is this is always a little tricky because we always worry that our path is the one we know. So the path that I followed, I know really well, and, and, and I'm not 100% sure it, it applies to all other areas, but I think it does. So at least in the sciences and the natural sciences, there's kind of three things they look for. So one is your GPA, you know, how you're doing, and depending on that, depending on the area you want to, to go in, there isn't just a good GPA or not. Uh, so, for example, in psychology, in clinical psychology, everybody wants to go into clinical psychology. And so just a ton of students apply for clinical psychology. So in that case, your GPA has to be really good just because you have so much competition. But if you're going into cognitive psychology or developmental psychology or social psychology, there's all these other branches. Some of them you don't need to be that impressive. Um, they're not that popular of a program. Um, so you just need a good GPA, especially a good one later in your career is often, you know, and a nice thing to show that you're really kind of kicking it in. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is usually some kind of standardized test like a GRE or something like that. So you have to, you know, do as well as you can on that. But the third thing other than your cumulative GPA is a letter from uh, an instructor that knows you well. And this is the thing I think most students put the least thought into until it's too late. Um, and, and then it becomes a problem. So here, here's the classic thing I'll, uh, I'll, I'll highlight, office hours. You guys, office hours are so underutilized. We do all these surveys where students say, I wish I had more time with faculty. 
okay, but then why are we sitting by ourselves in office hours <laughs> doing nothing? <laughs> like, here's the time. And it's intimidating for a student to, to especially if it's one-on-one, -on -one, you know, to be sitting across from a faculty member and having some sort of interaction. But there's so much you're learning through that interaction. And that, this is really where the communication skills are being developed. And, and you should see that as part of your tuition. Part of my tuition is to sit and be intimidated by some person <laughs> and to try to negotiate my way through that, to try to feel like and see if I can develop some sort of relationship and have a positive interaction here. Because that's a skill you're, you're, you're constantly thrown in the real world, thrown in rooms with strangers uh, and asked to kind of work with them in some way. Uh, and so I think everybody should be doing that. And, you know, sort of two reasons. One, the skill development that I'm highlighting. You should also have your cameras on when you do this online, by the way. I keep harping at my students for that. See it as a chance to learn what you and I are doing now, you know, and interactions through, through the internet. It's how many people will be interviewed in the future. So we should be practicing the skill anytime we, we can have a chance at it. Um, but the other reason you want to do that is when you want to get that letter, um, what they really want from that letter is something that isn't in your transcript. Your transcripts kind of says, how well can this student learn course material? And, and you can show you can learn it really well. Often in that letter, they want to know, is this person a really good critical thinker? Do, are they the kind of people that can come up with good research ideas and can design a great experiment or research project? Or do they have the creative thinking ability to kind of do that stuff? Um, how is their resilience, their personal resilience? Do you think they can um, excel in a, in a challenging program that's going to make demands of their time? So they really want that human side from the professor that knows you. And so often, I, I, I can't tell you how often, how often I get emails from people that say, sir, I was in your very large intro psych class. I didn't come to office hours, uh, but now I'm applying for some job and, uh, and I can't find any other faculty member that will write me a letter or something. Will you write me a letter of support? And I say, well, okay, but all I can really say is you did well in my class, which they can see on the transcript. <laughs> I can't, I don't know you. Uh, so you want at least one professor, at least one, more if you can, to kind of know you. So if you're in a course and you find that material really interesting, come up with reasons to go to office hours. And, and you know, be there asking questions about the material, trying to impress, because this is a person you might want to do research with as well. It kind of goes back to that, you know, how do you get into research? Well, the real beginning of that story is office hours. Like the, the very first place you can start planting those seeds. And, and with my students, that's almost where I invariably meet them first. They impress me during office hours. There are people who are there with a genuine interest in the material, questioning things, coming up with ideas of their own. And, you know, modeling that sort of behavior in office hours kind of shows this person your, your, your abilities to do those things, sets you up for potential research. And even if they don't do that, you know, one of the students who emails me and says, can you write me a letter? And by the way, I was in your office hours. I came all, the, you know, quite regularly. I can say, can you send me a picture? And they, they do. And I'm like, oh yeah, okay, okay, good. I, I remember you. We, we'll be, we'll be fine. I can, I can say honest, you know, positive things. So a long story to say, you know, milk those, milk those office hours. If you get a chance to interact with profs, do it. Uh, because that third part is often what they know who we are. So when you're applying to a grad program, especially let's say in my area, and somebody's thinking about taking you on as a student, I, I joke about this too. It's almost like a short-term marriage. <laughs> it's almost <laughs> like they're saying, if I accept this person into my lab, they're probably going to be in my life for, for five to eight years, maybe, or four, four to six years, I should say. And if I'm, if I'm enjoying them being here, this will be great. But if it turns out I make a bad decision and accept somebody into my lab that I don't enjoy interacting with, man, that's going to be hard. I'm going to have to try to get them through the program and do whatever I can and either let them loose at some point, which feels like crap, none of us want to do that, or we're going to have to try to carry them through to a PhD. And so how do they know? they trust fellow profs. So when that other prof is, so if I'm writing you a letter and I'm saying, hey, I would, I would accept her as a graduate student. I think she has all the critical thinking skills and et cetera that she needs to excel in your program. That makes that prof, especially if they know, we, we kind of know each other. If you know that person, you say, oh, okay, Bill from Laurier really likes this person. That makes me feel like I'm not making a mistake if I accept them. I'll look at all the other stuff, but it's the letter where the humanity comes through. 
So try to kind of connect with that with your profs and then have somebody representing the human in you uh, when you're applying to those programs. Um, how do you think by completing these programs, the students will be able to find work in real life? I mean, this, this, this is what haunts me, <laughs> honestly. It, it sort of haunts me. Um, although, let, let me rephrase it a different way and let's see how this comes in. I've been asked before, if we could design the perfect test that, that I, as a professor, have done what I could do for my student, what would that test look like? And, and for me, the answer is an interview, an interview for a job that that student really wants. So I imagine a student getting an opportunity for a job they would love, but there's two or three other people and, and they have to win an interview. So they have to go and sit in front of a bunch of people and somehow make those people both like them as a human. This is a human I, I wouldn't mind rubbing elbows with on a regular basis, you know, coming into work and talking to this person. But also as a, as a worker, I think they have all the skills and talents they need to do really, really well and that we could do some really powerful things together. And you have like about half an hour, an hour to kind of impress them in that way or less sometimes. Um, that's where I want my students to get to so that they, they can be the one that aces that interview um, and, you know, can show again, I'm saying these same things over, but the ability to think critically, the ability to be creative, the ability to communicate well with people, work collaboratively with them. If they can show all of those things, then they're going to win the interview. And I also think those are the, that, that's our, that's our weird answer to we don't even know what the job market is. By the time you graduate, there will be jobs that didn't exist in my day. Um, and there, there are jobs that exist now that will no longer be there uh, in a few years. The job market is constantly fluctuating. So we can't make you the best, I don't know, TV repair person ever, because we don't know if anyone will need a TV repair person down the road. But we can make you the best sort of... Um, a person well positioned to succeed no matter what that is. And, and I think that's what we kind of, you know, whatever career you fall into, um, like you know, I, I like to think our good students, we could drop them in the middle of the police force and say, hey, do something interesting and relevant with these people here, come up with some ideas. Or we could pick them up and drop them into some company, an advertising company and, and say the same thing. Uh, and, and those, if they have those skills, then they're, yes, they're gonna have to come up to speed with the context a little bit but they can succeed in any context. And, and I think that's, you know, then they can sort of steer and find what they want, but the hope is once they find what they want, we've tooled them up enough so that they can grab it and, and get what they want. Uh, and so that's, that's sort of how I think of it in the future. And that's how I think about, you know, best preparing you guys for the future, because it's, it's uncertain. We don't know what that job market is going to be for you guys. But developing the skills is really the one aspect that is gonna get you out of the pool of candidates, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it will get you the job <laughs> and it will allow you to succeed in the job almost no matter what job. And, and by the way, I always like to throw in this little twist too. It's, it's very easy when you get thinking about these skills to get talking about jobs and careers um, because that's where a lot of students' minds are uh, at your age. But I call these the skills of life success, not, not career success, life success. Uh, and to give you just a taste of that, you know, critical thinking. If you have good critical thinking abilities, you're probably going to pick a better life partner. And if we just think of that for a moment, you know, picking the right or the wrong life partner, how much does that affect you and the rest of your life, that, that decision you make? Uh, and then when you do have that right life partner, you know, do you have the creativity to keep them interested in you? you know, are you coming up with good Valentine's Day ideas or whatever <laughs> it may be? Uh, and do you have the communication skills to really effectively, you know, be able to live together with that person and, and strive after your goals together. And so all of these skills, yes, they help you in a career context, but they also help you in a life context. The, these are the skills of success, of growth. Uh, and so that's the best thing I think we can give to you guys. And, and for me, almost the rest of it is almost an excuse. Psychology, sure. It's a good excuse for me to exercise your skills here. Physics, sure. <laughs> but will you use will you use the psychology I taught you five years from now? Maybe, maybe. Um, if you need it, it's on Wikipedia. If there's any information you need, you can probably find it. But will you use the skills that that you teach? Absolutely, every day, a hundred percent. And so, so I really feel those skills are really important, and and that's why sort of my career 
I, I kind of turned from cognitive psychologist to where I have simply because it's, it's funny, you start to feel like you have so many years to make a difference. Uh, and that's something I thought made a difference. If we could teach you those skills, that would be the best thing we could do for you. Sure. Um, so do you think it's better to move on to higher um, level of education, continue to earn education, or just move to straight to work first? Yeah, I mean, it really depends on, so I, I like to talk a lot both within university and beyond in terms of what I call resonance. So, so we talk about, okay, here we go. I'm gonna get, we have a guitar here, but this guitar okay. is, is an electric guitar. And so if I, str if I play it, you, you might hear something. I don't know. You'd need my headphones, maybe. Yeah, we can hear <laughs> You might hear something, but not, but not a whole lot, right? Whereas imagine an acoustic guitar, one of the wood ones with the hole in the middle. If I did the same thing, it would be a lot louder. Why? There's nothing different about the strings or any of this part. What's different is the sound is able to get into an acoustic guitar and resonate with the top and the sides of the guitar. And that vibration of the guitar with the strings makes it all louder and more powerful. Okay, so <laughs> when you're taking courses and such, every now and then you feel that. You feel like, hey, that person is talking. Imagine them plucking strings at the front. They're talking, but what they're saying, I'm thinking about, and it's really resonating. And it's something I find you know, really fascinating. It's like it's causing all these internal vibrations <laughs> of a sort where I'm like connecting with what's being said and thinking about it more. Those things that you resonate with are really important to your future happiness. You really want to end up in a career where, yes, you're getting enough money to su support yourself and your family with, you know, other people who may be part of it. That that allows you obviously just to, to live in a comfortable way. But you'd like to kind of be waking up in the morning, the alarm goes off, and thinking, oh, okay, I got to go to work today. If you picked well, that's not a dep depressing thing. That's kind of like, okay, what, what am I going to do at work today? And, you know, that's how I feel like my job is, that, that I enjoy my job. And for the amount of training I put in, the years, I could have probably been a medical doctor or a lawyer or a marketing person that made three times what I make, probably, uh, salary-wise. But I like this life. <laughs> and, and, you know, no, don't cry for me. I'm, I'm doing fine salary-wise. Uh, but, sort of but that's sort of the point, which is there's, when it comes to money, it should be enough. Um, but when it comes to what what makes you feel good, what you're resonating with, where you want to be, that should be weighed more at some point. So if if that means going to grad school, you know, if, if you want to be a professor, for example, then then you have to go to grad school, then absolutely you should follow that if that's where your passion takes you. But if you want to be the best travel agent in the world, and, and that's what you absolutely love is, is being around people who are going on vacation and setting them up in great vacations and and getting some perks yourself and being able to travel every now and then, you know, if that's your dream job for you, you don't need a master's or a PhD to do that. Um, if you're going to be happy doing that and the salary is, is in line with, okay, I could live off of that, then, uh, you know, I would say follow your heart first um, and follow your bank account or, or your pocketbook <laughs> sort of second um, and look for those things. So, yeah, so the right answer isn't going to, even university isn't right for everybody. There's some people who, you know, this isn't the kind of experience they want at all. So I think different people will be at different spots. And, you know, always keep in mind that you can always go back. Like if, if you choose, if you think, yeah, with the bachelor's is enough, I want to go explore and, and do something. What some people find, it's, this is not a bad story at all, is they go and do something and they kind of like it, but they then realize, oh, but I want to do something more and to do that more those people who have that job that i want i now know they took some extra degree or did this or did that and so then they go back to school um, and sure they could have had that degree already but now they're going back knowing what they want and kind of you know with a purpose that's that's really different so feel free to take that time to explore what can i do with what i got am i happy um, if i'm not happy can i figure out what i really want now and kind of make that so sometimes living in the real world for a while kind of makes you look at your education a little differently. And then when you go back, you, you want it better. You, you really appreciate it. Like, oh, this is, I understand what this is gonna get me now. And so I really wanna do it well. So happiness is the real key. Uh, and an inspiration to a lot of our students, many of them wanna know the path it took to become a lecturer at the University of Toronto. Would you mind sharing some details with us? 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great example of, um, in my case, um, not over planning too much. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's yeah. I certainly am not, I'm not going to tell you a story of, oh, I had this in my sights and, and this is where I went. So when I, I started not wanting to go to university. My father was very strong on when you graduate from high school, you either get a full-time job, you go to university, or you join the army. One of the two. You can always join the army. Joining the army was always the scary one. <laughs> if you're not doing one of these first two things, then I'm going to tolerate you for so long, but then I'm going to suggest you join the army. And I'm not an army kind of guy. Uh, so I, I worked for a while. I didn't want to go to university. I worked for a while. Uh, and then I eventually went, I got fired <laughs> from my job because <laughs> I hated it. I was at Kmart. I was a manager at Kmart. And I hated it so much. I got fired just before Christmas, which is embarrassing. I deserved it uh, fully. Uh, and then I, knowing my dad, in January, I, I signed up for university because I knew I had to be going to university or else he'd be sending me to the army. <laughs> so, so I went to university. Uh, I did some psychology and some computer science. I didn't know which I wanted to do. Uh, and at that time, my strategy was I wanted to be a music producer. So I, I knew computers were important to the music of the future, and, and I thought psychology might be as well, to interacting with bands and trying to get the best out of them. So that was my intent through about two and a half years of university. Uh, and then at some point I took a course, um, memory and cognition course with the professor Wayne Donaldson. He had a weird way of testing. Uh, Wayne would, um, we would learn about all these experiments, and then he'd say, when you come to a test, you're going to get six figures. They're going to be the, the data, the results from some experiment. You have to pick three of those and you have to tell me everything you know about that experiment. So what was the theory it was testing? What was the actual experiment itself? What were the results? Did they support the theory or not? And you have to say what you would do next. What would you do as the researcher to follow up this experiment? Um, I loved these tests. I, they, they were right up my alley. Uh, I really enjoyed them. And at the end of the course, he actually pulled me aside and said, you know, the way you think, you think like a scientist thinks. You, you should be a scientist. And, and this was something I never saw in myself. I never thought about myself that way. Sometimes we need that. Sometimes we need somebody else to see us in a way we don't see ourselves. Uh, and he said, actually, to me, take one more year of university. I was trying to cram everything into a bunch. He said, no, take it slower. Take an extra year. Get your grades higher where they need to be. Uh, and then you should go to grad school and you should, and I just kind of listened to him and <laughs> I did what he said <laughs> and, you know, really everything fell into play. I loved research. I just enjoyed it. I did well in grad school because of that. So I came to UT Scarborough in 95 as sort of a up and coming research star as just about all the profs hired at U of T R. Um, so I was publishing a bunch of work on consciousness and on memory. Uh, and that's when I started teaching and I didn't know I loved teaching. Uh, I just wasn't aware of it until I really started teaching and I started realizing how much I enjoyed that. And then again, slowly over time, even that snuck into my research where it's like that resonance I talked to about, I was no longer kind of resonating with the memory research I was doing. It felt like I was going through motions and I kept thinking about the class and how I could make it better. And so I, I said, well, I'm just going to shift my research to this then. Let, let me find something where I can spend all my time doing what I love, which is what makes a prof job great. By the way. <laughs> you can kind of shape what your job actually is uh, and align it with your passions. So, you know, all this to say, and this is what I sometimes say to students, you should have a plan. Um, you know, you should be going through your studies with a certain plan in mind, but you shouldn't let that plan rule. Uh, as you as you go through and kind of are following that, other things may grab you. Other things may resonate in the way I've described yeah. to you. Uh, as psychology started to resonate more with me and this idea of being a scientist started to resonate more with me, and then it kind of pulled me that direction. And, and I think you, you, you can't go wrong following that, you know, sort of emotional resonance. If, if you really enjoy thinking about something, then having that steer your ship. And, and that's what it's been for me all along. Like I hit teaching and I go, wow, I didn't know I enjoyed it. <laughs> but now this is what I really want to focus on. I want to follow that. Uh, and so I took this very roundabout path to get where I am. Uh, but, Sometimes the universe just had a better plan for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, it's very, you know, I, I mean, I, I have to say I, I consider myself ridiculously lucky. I'm still amazed so many people take me seriously. I, I just feel like it's <laughs> <laughs> that people take seriously um, and it's a, it's a great job so I was extremely lucky along the way 
uh, if not so overly thoughtful, but it all worked. And out we are well. so lucky to have you as a professor in campus. Um, can right. I ask what was the role of music and art in your life? Yeah, big, um, especially music, um, not so much art, but the funny thing about music is I was um, a very serious listener of music and, and a listener of bands that seemed to be saying something. Uh, and so I was the kind of kid, and it was a very different musical world at the time. So people produced albums, bands produced albums. Uh, it wasn't all about hit singles or just, you know, the song being whatever. And I was the kind of guy that would lay on the bed and put the headphones on and listen to an, an album fully through and especially bands like Rush. I don't know how well a lot of these bands are known now um, or Genesis. These were bands that would do what are called concept albums sometimes. So they would be telling a story across a bunch of songs and I was always trying to understand what they were saying and, and I was being very motivated. Um, a couple of examples, Rush has a song called Something for Nothing. And, you know, the lyrics, which I probably won't get exactly right. I'm just going to try to pull them out of my subconscious. But it says something like, you can't get something for nothing. You can't get freedom for free. You won't get wise with the sleep still in your eyes, no matter what your dreams may be. So that, that phrase was basically, hey, if you want something in life, you got to go out there and get it. It's not just going to come to you. You don't get things for nothing. You, if you're just going to lay around all day with the sleep still in your eyes, you're not. So songs like that motivated me. and taught me i think a lot these intellectual songwriters really kind of steered my life a little, little bit uh and and um yeah motivate me rush made me want to know psychology because there's a lot of psychology in, in what and what they do in, in a lot of music but the funny thing is i never saw myself as a performer uh, of music um just was it wasn't in my mind I, I didn't even have that dream i did have the dream of as i mentioned earlier being a producer i always thought the life of bands looked horrible, like being on the road. Yes, you're famous or whatever. But when I looked at that, I thought, I don't want to live like that. That's, that looks terrible. But to see, be in a studio and have bands visit and work with them to create some album, that was right up my alley. And I thought, okay, now you guys can go out on the road. I'll hang out here and hang out with the next band. <laughs> that, that was me. And, and, you know, really that was it until I was pretty much 40. Um, we had a dog that we loved dearly that had cancer and that we used to travel a lot. We used to scuba dive a lot. And uh, we knew we just, well, we could do that, but we wanted it to be quality of life for our dog for her last few years. And so we decided we weren't going to travel so much. And my wife said, let's learn to play guitar. And so literally at that point in time was the first time and it was like twinkle, twinkle, little star. And, and I didn't have much time. So I would sneak a half an hour in here and there, but heck, one day we had a band and one day we're performing out and, and doing all the stuff. And so all this music stuff that's, that's happening, including releasing our first single uh, the other day, our, our video of our first original song, this is all just stuff I never thought I'd get to do. I never even dreamed of doing, and, and it just makes me feel like a little kid when I get to do this stuff. It's like, man. It's I just quite impressive. <laughs> it's, Thank it's you fun. so it much. It is my therapy. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thank you cool. so much for this amazing interview. I'm sure this is going to add so much value and perspective to all of our audience. But before we say the actual goodbye, do you have any tips or recommendations for us, for students? Well, first of all, let me say thank you for, for your questioning. There's a couple of things that, like, I, I loved having that opportunity to tell students how to approach research uh, well, uh, which is really good. I, I say that a lot, but nice to be able to share that here. I think what I would say to them now is, boy, this is a tough time <laughs> to be a student. I mean, it's a tough time in general, but, but we're all dealing with all the stresses of COVID. And then you guys on top of that are trying to do all your learning online, again, with instructors that are learning the craft as they go. Uh, and so, first of all, just know that we do understand. I, th I think sometimes it can feel to students like faculty don't not understand that and don't care. And it's just kind of like, too bad, this is what it is. So at least some of us understand it and care uh, and, and wish it wasn't so. I think you will learn a lot negotiating all of these problems, um, including learning a lot about yourself and those self-control kind of skills to do the online learning well. But wow, tough time. So should you ever feel challenged? Should you feel like it's a lot? Um, of course you do. And, and you should never feel there's anything weird or, or strange about feeling, you know, a lot of anxiety or, or anything during this time because it's, it's an anxious time. Uh, uh, so 
I don't know. Uh, I've had some students say they want to take a bit of time off and come to university. And, and for some of them, I think that might be the right idea um, if, if they feel they need to do that. For those of you that are sticking through it, you know, fantastic. Um, it's, it's hard work. Uh, and I think you will benefit as weirdly as it sounds. You know, having to go through this challenging form of education will probably make you more resilient. And that when you're in sure. a job situation in the future and suddenly something horrible happens, we've done horrible. <laughs> we've been through horrible. <laughs> so let's, let's see what this new horrible is and let's take it on. And, and I hope some of that sort of spirit carries through uh, once we're on the other side of COVID. And I look forward to seeing some of you guys. In person. <laughs> oh, Thank God. you so much, Professor Jordan. Thank you. Thanks everyone for watching this episode. Hope you get to know your professor better. If you know anyone who might be benefited from this video, please share it with them. Thank you.